Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with James Mushore, founder and former Group Chief Executive Officer of NMBZ Holdings Limited. Enjoy this informative conversation. So, James Mshuri, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. James, Great to uh, be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to start you, James, exactly where you are right now. Semi-retired, retired, retired, what's happening to you? Well, one can never fully retire. Uh, There's always something to keep one busy. Mm -hmm. Um, So currently I look after my mother, (laughs) who's going to be 86 this year. And... um, that's one of the things my father said on his deathbed, look after your mother. Mm. Um, and uh, I also dabble in some consultancy. I'm, I still get consulted from time to time by people who want some assistance in terms of their businesses. Mm. They want some assistance in terms of raising funding for their businesses. Or right now, some divesting because they're tired of what's happening here. So uh, that keeps me fairly busy. And then I also have a small property portfolio that I, that I look after on behalf of the family. Mm. Let, let me, with, interesting, Dad said, look after your mom, and that's exactly what you're doing. What else did Dad teach you that's made you who you are right now? Um, I think the overriding teaching my, for my father was that you must be able to wake up every morning look in the mirror and like what you see. In essence, what he was saying to me is, do to others what you'd like done to you. Mm. And That's and the overriding. That's the overriding uh, uh, mm. but a theme from, from daddy's uh, um, side of uh, upbringing. What about mom, the one that you're taking care of now? What, what is it that she imparted to, to you? She's, as you know, women are always the power behind the throne. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, whilst they might not be as in your face as one's father would be, um, they're there, they're the strength, they're the support, mm. and they're the wise people. Mm. At the end of the, I mean, I, I still consult my mother to this day, a mm. uh, very wise woman, and she's the mother that anybody would love to have. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> James, you, 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 you've just said that uh, you never fully retire. When you look at where you are right now, James, and looking back to where you started from, what would you tell a 21-year-old James Mishore? Um, <laughs> there's some battles not worth fighting. Uh-huh. Um, but then at the same token, um, there's a number of things that... I think if I had my life over again, yeah. I'd still be exactly the same. Okay. Um, insofar as um, living in Zimbabwe is concerned, it's a terribly difficult environment to live in. Mm-hmm. If one is a straightforward person, mm-hmm. um, it's tremendously frustrating regarding what one could achieve if we had the environment that allowed us mm-hmm. to show our best foot forward. Mm-hmm. So the, my teaching would be perseverance. Um, persevere. Mm. Continue striving. Right. Um, because life is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, obviously, apart from the teaching from uh, your father and your mother, you went, you went to formal education. Take us through that journey of uh, the schools that you went through and what those schools taught you, starting with primary, secondary, and, and, and taking us to high school? Mm. Primary really started um, uh, St. Michael's. And how I got to St. Michael's Prep School, which was a school in, uh, as you know, in Borodale. It's a prep school for 
well, it used to be the prep school for Hartman House and St. George's. They've parted ways right now. But in essence, um, my parents were staunch Roman Catholics. And um, every Sunday we'd attend Mass. We lived in Highfields at the time, at the um, church in Highfields, St. Peter's. And um, one Sunday the parish priest said at the end of Mass that the Archbishop liked to celebrate Mass in all of his parishes. And it was Highfield's turn the following week. And it was normal for one of the parishioners to take the Archbishop for breakfast after Mass. And uh, he asked the, the parishioners, so who here knows what white people eat for breakfast? So, <laughs> so, my, so my father nudged my mother, who'd been to some cookery classes, and my mother put up her hand and the priest said, right, he's coming to your house next Sunday. So the following Sunday after Mass, Archbishop Francis Markhall, as he was, the Archbishop of Salisbury, came to our house at 446 Old Highfields for breakfast. So whilst he sat on the veranda making small talk with my father, my mother was slaving away in the kitchen cooking what white people like for breakfast. My sister, my older sister, and I, Josephine, were playing in the garden. And the Archbishop asked my dad, so where does your daughter go to school? And my dad says, well, Mija School, down the road there. And he says, your son, where is he going to go to school? Because you could see that I was a bit young for school. And my dad says, well, where else could he go but the local school? And Francis Markle said to my dad, well, I want to start an, an experiment of multiracial schooling. Would you allow me to use your children as part of that experiment? Wow. And my dad said, well, anything's better than the local school. At that time, as, as you might be aware, Trevor, the education budget was split 50-50. Mm -hmm. A quarter of a million white people at most, and seven, eight million black people. It's 50-50. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So a very disproportionate sharing of the resources. So the following year, my sister went to Nagel House in uh, Mar Marondera, Marondelis as it was at that time. Yeah. And I went to St. Michael's uh, as a boarder. Um, 92, I think, uh, white boys, me and my cousin Solomon Chuesha, the only black boys there at the time. Yeah. Over the years, more and more uh, black children got introduced into the schools at, at different stages. Um, by the time I finished St. George's, there was 36 black pupils in St. George's. Uh, 365 boys and 36 of us mm. were black. So 10% was black. But in those first couple of years, it was at St. Michael's, I mean, they were, we were there standing back to back, defending each other against this white horde, mm. who treated us like they did their staff on their farms. You know, there was the usual obscenities, the usual uh, terms that they used for us. And uh, this is what we had to put up with. What 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 um, were your what were your takeaways from that experience, um, James? What are the main takeaways? Well, it was yeah. Please proceed. Mm. I I got a first class education. Mm. I must say, um, I was very fortunate that I was uh, bright and diligent, and um, I remember going home to. In fact, my my parents used to come and visit on Sundays. And uh, the first few terms, I'd be in tears because of all the bruises I'd be showing them from getting beaten up. And my mom would be in tears as well. And my dad would say, I'm sorry, son, but this is the only way you're going to get a decent education. You have to put up with it. The only one who's better than you, son, is somebody who's more intelligent than you. Mm. Not because they have a different color skin to you. Mm. And so I persevered. I used to come top of my class. One incident I'd like to relate to you, sure. uh, Trevor, is one of the open days. So open day was when the parents came to visit and went into the classrooms to see how their sons were doing. Mm. We used to have a board, and on the board would be the names of all the children, with the top performing one at the top, and with number of gold stars after his name. Mm. And uh, my name was consistently on top. And my best friend um, happened to be white, and his name was Second. And um, 
his parents were in the room, as were my parents. And his mom turned around to him and said, I won't say his name, but he said, son, why do you let this kaffir beat you all the time? Wow. Wow. And my father heard this, and he turned around to him and he says, Mr. Sir, why are you teaching your son the hatred that hmm. adults have for each other because of the color of their skin? If open your, your hand, and if you cut your palm, red blood will come out. Hmm. If I cut my palm, the same red blood will come out. We're the same underneath. The only thing that's different is this skin covering. Don't teach your son this hatred that we have. Mm. It, it mustn't continue. Mm. And she was very embarrassed and uh, she left the room. Mm. That's something I remember um, from my primary school. As obviously, as we got older, things got a little easier. Um, another incident I'll relate to you is I was, I was very good at hockey, field hockey. And I turned up for our first team when I was at St. George's. And I was also selected for Michonne and Trials uh, to play hockey. And we were playing there at the police grounds at the time. And uh, from, from the youngsters that had been selected, they were going to select the team for Michonne and then ultimately the national team. Um, whilst play was up at the top end of the field, I suddenly heard, get the kaffir, get the kaffir. Oh. And this white boy came running to me and he slashed my ankle with a hockey stick. The line referee saw this and turned away. I had to be carried off the field. That was the end of my representing uh, the Shonland at uh, Childs. Mm. But that sort of incident was, was commonplace um, uh, during my time. And so... I find it very rich when we are referred to as boys that were privileged and the nurse brigade. Mm. Yes, we were very fortunate, um, but uh, it wasn't easy. Mm. It was very difficult at the time. Wow. That, that, that's, that's, the, that's, that's deep uh, right there, James. How did you deal with it? Um, the, this racism right in your face and in many instances, uh, do you think you carry some of the scars at all, apart from just, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking offense at people saying that you're privileged? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, there's some things that one doesn't and one will never forget. Mm. Um, it taught me to be strong. Um, it taught me to hide my emotions sometimes to my own detriment, often to my family's dismay. Mm. But uh, it taught me to be a survivor. Mm. And, and that incident um, that you relate, uh, where your father raises the issue and the woman walks away, is, is, that, is that a lesson in forgiveness or what is it? You know, my father was a remarkable man. And... Uh, I remember at his death, one of the nuns at Nazareth House walked up to me and said, you know, James, your father should be beatified. Your father should be a saint. Mm. That was my father. He bore no grudges, but only goodwill towards all men, in spite of what they may have done mm. to him or to us. And this is how we were brought up. Mm. Do to others as you want them to do unto you. And then you, you left uh, St. George's, uh, you went to, which university did you go to, James? I went to the UK to what was then, uh, what was a Polytech at the time, which is now, um, I forget, the De Montfort University um, to read business studies. Uh, that was in the UK. I joined my sister, actually, who was nursing in the Midlands, in Leamington Spa. And then at Independence came back here and joined uh, an accounting firm, mm. Dairy Allen Brown and Fraser, which became Cooper's and Library. Cooper's and Library. Which is now locally Ernst Young, but internationally PwC Price Coopers. Mm. Mm. So that was um, 
in at the at, at independence in eighty mm. that I did that. Um, qualified as a chartered accountant, um, and then from there was uh, admitted to the partnership after a few years as a second black partner at uh, Coopers and Abbey. The first was my very good friend Freeman Kembo, and um, from there. I got to the stage where I said, well, I'm not learning anymore. My colleagues aren't teaching me anymore. Um, and I asked for a secondment to London. I got a secondment to London, went to work in the, in the city, the city of London, um, worked in the financial services there, um, financial co uh, consultancy, a number of very exciting assignments. And then um, at the end of my secondment, my very good friend, uh, Julius Marconi, called me. He was in Washington at the time and said to me, so what are you going to do now that you, your scholar is coming to you? And I said, well, I suppose I'll go back to Cooper's neighbor. And he says, I'm thinking of starting a bank. You know, I've started banks all over the world. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that it's time we started a bank in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Would you like to join me? Wow. And I said, well, let's have a look at it. Uh, what have you got? Have you got a business plan? He says, no, I've, he says, I've got some numbers that one of my uh, future colleagues has, has, has got from RAL Merchant Bank, as it was at the time. Yeah. And that was my good friend, Francis Muto, who was at RAL right. Merchant Bank. Yeah. And uh, he says, um, I'll ask Francis to send you some of this stuff. And then from there, you can have a look at it. Mm. So Francis sent me this stuff, which was like cash flows and budgets and stuff. And I looked at it and um, I said to him, um, Francis, I think, your, I think your formula need looking at because this thing looks too good to be true. Uh, can you send me some of your assumptions and your formulas so I can just check them? So Francis sent this to me mm -hmm. and he also sent me updated numbers. And I looked at this and I thought, my God, this is like printing money. And I called Julius and I said, I'm in. I'll join you. Wow. That was in 89. So the... the came... So pr proceed, proceed, James, proceed. Came back to uh, Zimbabwe uh, with Coopers and I brand. Um, and from there, we started working on the business plan. There was... William Nyembo was also one of our partners and uh, Francis Zimuto. And I, Julius was still in Washington. We put together the business plan and then submitted it to the Registrar of Banks and Financial Institutions for a banking license. Sadly, the response was, well, what do black people know about running banks? From our fellow black people at wow. the Registrar. What do you guys know about running banks? We said to them, well, we have done it. We've uh, in the various sectors, two of my colleagues, that was Francis and William, were in the banking sector. Jews had formed banks around the world. And I was a chartered accountant who'd been involved in auditing banks, who'd been involved in, in uh, doing financial consultancy for banks. And so we knew how these things operated. It took us, Trev, from November 19... Um, 90... I think it was, mm. to 1st of June, 1993, to get a license. That's how long it took to get the banking license. And what were, in your sense, apart from the fact that uh, the, uh, the licensing authority was saying you're black, in what other stumbling blocks did you, did you perceive or did you see? Well, um, raising the capital was also mm. difficult, um, doing the rounds and trying to convince the different funds, uh, because we approached a lot of the, the local pension funds at the time to come in as shareholders. So that was, that took a while, um, getting people's confidence that you could um, use their money uh, and, and, and build a business with it. Mm. But uh, we were fortunate, we got by in. IFC, the International Finance Corporation, came in as a shareholder as well. They had 15% of us. And when uh, some of the funds saw the IFC coming in, they couldn't wait to get in. Mm. So we, and then we also made personal sacrifices. 
you know, mortgage the dog to be able to put the capital in, etc. And um, uh, we're able to start the bank, well, open doors, first of June 93. Mm -hmm. I was still with Coopers and Lab at the time in Zambia. I was running the practice in Zambia. And uh, I had to give one year's notice to retire from the partnership, and which I then did. And I and joined full-time in, in August 94. So you, you, you're saying you looked at the numbers and your, 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 your eyes went uh, pop because of the numbers that you're looking at. Uh, is, is there anything else, James, that attracted you to this idea, apart just from the money? Well, you know, Trev, I, um, in wanting to um, look forward in terms of the family, one thing I was very conscious of is that I couldn't take my CA certificate off the wall and hand it to my son and say, there you are, son, you're now a child accountant or you're now a partner of Coops and Ireland. I wanted to be able to do something that I would then be able to leave for the family and the extended family going forward. That was one of the reasons why I thought this is worth a punt. That's a long uh, time, James, to wait to be licensed. Talk to me about the highs and lows as you waited. Is this thing going to happen? Won't it happen? What will make it happen? What will, make, uh, what will open doors? That must have been a trying time in your life. Share with me that, th those moments. It, 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 it was, and it was, it was very expensive. Well, certainly for me, um, because I was the... Uh, in the documentation, because uh, of my particular experience, I was able to. Uh, I, I, my name was Ford as the as as the uh, chief executive. Julius at the time was with the IFC, and uh, obviously we didn't want a situation where we were disclosing the fact that he was involved uh, before he could finish his uh, notice period there, mm -hmm. um, because we didn't want any potential issues of conflict of interest. And um, so whilst I was in Zambia, um, I had to often, at very short notice, fly down to Harare for meetings with potential investors. And in particular, the IFC, I'd get a call from the IFC, say, oh, we, we'll be in Harare tomorrow morning. Uh, can we meet at such and such o'clock? And I'd have to charter a plane, a private plane from Lusaka to fly, to come up to, not, not from Lusaka, from Harare, to fly to Lusaka, pick me up, bring me for the meeting, and then I'd have to pretend like I'd been there all the time. Mm. Finish the meeting and then fly back to Lusaka where I had my responsibilities running an accounting practice. Mm. Um, and then also just the attitude of the uh, licensing authorities where it was more putting obstacles in our way than actually assisting us get involved in the sector given the fact that this country belonged to us. That was particularly frustrating. And what lessons do you, do you think you got from that period? Was there anything that you learned from that? You know, Trev, sadly, this continues to this day, mm -hmm. where we have this pull and down syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the, the typical thing where you see somebody driving a, a very flash car in the street, and the typical thing that we fellow blacks say is, where did he steal the money from? Sadly, in Zimbabwe, that is often true. But, you know, other races would say, ooh, I, I admire that car. I'd love to get one one day. We have this thing where we, we, we find it difficult to work with each other. I was very fortunate that I had uh, people who didn't care where I came from, didn't care Kutundai Enichi, it was a question of, right, you have the abilities, you have the qualifications, let's work together. Mm. I didn't give a damn that Julius was from Manikaland or that Francis was from Mashingo. I really, really couldn't give a damn. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to work with these guys because something in my gut told me that we could achieve something with, the, with each other. Mm. Wow. And, and then the, uh, you get the license, the correct me if I'm wrong, James was uh, National Merchant Bank of Zimbabwe, NMBZ, 
Were you the first uh, blood bank to be licensed? We were the first bank to be licensed. Mm. So you made um, history. You were pioneers. We, we were, yes, uh, we were the merchant bank. There was four others at the time. We were the fifth. Mm. And within 18 months, Trev, we were the largest merchant bank. Mm -hmm. And we did this through providing a service. The four banks that were there, the four merchant banks that were there, were very much an old boys network. They didn't poach each other's clients. They had a cartel in terms of interest rates. And they, you know, they, they, they just muddied along. We were there. We were hungry. We would say to clients, if we can't produce your letter of credit within so many hours, we'd do it for nothing. And so word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. In 18 months, we're the largest merchant bank. What was it? Uh, were you uh, innovative? Were you hustling? Was it, what, what, where, where did it all come? Where did the success come from? New product? It, it, came, from, it came from our hunger to, 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 to succeed. Um, and with that, we also had a number of other things that we, we, we worked on. We, we wanted to ensure that, you know, like the typical uh, uh, um, sole proprietorship where the owner dies and then things fall apart. Mm. We put together systems that would ensure that this organization would outlive us. Um, with my background in the um, accounting sector, uh, I uh, used a lot of their HR material to put together set staff manuals, codes of conduct, etc. We made sure that uh, when one was being interviewed, you were, it was a question of merit. It wasn't a question of the fact that you related to so-and-so. So there were declarations that had to be made by potential employees regarding anyone that might be related to the organization. And these were reviewed on a regular basis to make sure that we only hired the best. And so in terms of that success, it was because we were recruiting people who were the best at what they did, uh, recruiting youngsters that we could train because we could see potential in them, and we wanted a situation where we would get business through word of mouth, people recommending us because they had a good experience with us. And to this day, uh, NMB strives for excellence. Mm -hmm. And you quickly got into um, uh, facilitating big deal uh, management buyouts uh, and um, IPOs. Uh, the one that stands out for me was the CBZ IPO, if I'm, wrong, um, if I'm wrong, not wrong, and then the uh, Econet IPO. How, how much did that uh, do to um, uh, cement your name and your reputation in the market, uh, uh, James? Yeah, at that time, Trev, there wasn't many uh, merchant banks that were doing um, corporate finance advisory services. And this to us was a field that um, had little competition and we had the skills for it. And so when um, Gideon Gono, who was running CBZ at the time, did the rounds at the banks asking for somebody to help him list. And you remember the history of CBZ, it would have been Bank of Credit and Commerce. Yeah. And uh, from there became Commercial Bank of Zimbabwe. Mm. And nobody wanted to touch it mm. because of this smell that it carried regarding the Bank of Credit and Commerce. And uh, Gideon had gotten there and he rehabilitated or tried to rehabilitate it. Uh, but what he needed was more capital to be able to do more business. And so I think we were one of the last banks that he actually visited. And he came in and said, well, would you guys list me? Um, I went and consulted with Julius and we agreed and we listed them. Four times over subscribed, if I recall correctly. Um, the same thing with Econet. Um, Strive was a, 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 from retrofit, uh, from all his difficulties that he had with obtaining his license that he eventually got, and uh, needing the capital to be able to afford to buy base stations and grow his business. Mm. And he came to us, and we listed him. And from you there... Proceed. And from there, he's one of now the, one of the biggest companies, not the biggest companies on the stock exchange. Mm. You, you, it must give give you quite a lot of uh, satisfaction to see to look back in the, the rearview mirror 
and see uh, what represents your success. CBZ still standing there, uh, Econet and Strive where he is, and many more others. Speak to me about uh, building that legacy, building that, uh, that reputation. You know, we were, the, I suppose, the go-to bank. Um, we, one of our philosophies was that we can't be the only success in, 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 on an island. It, it makes sense if there's more and more such successes. We have, we, we have the abilities in, in terms of the, the skills in this country. Uh, the more successful black businesses there are, the better. And we can be part of that. And so one of the other things that we used to do is, you know, there used to be a number of people who come along to us who didn't have the capital, the wherewithal, to be able to service the tenders that they'd got uh, to supply such and such a thing uh, uh, in, in, to government or local councils, etc. And uh, we would structure things so, such that uh, we'd give them the money, uh, paid directly to their, to their suppliers, they'd get whatever product that they needed to then beneficiate, uh, sell it, and their debtors were paid directly to us. We give them their profit, and we then also take back part of that loan. And we did this ad infinitum in terms of black businesses and grew a number of black businesses, um, you know, quite a number that, that uh, one could name. Vary Chem was one of them, Vary Chem mm. Laboratories. There's, um, you know, old age, getting up with some of the names I can't remember. But there's a number of black businesses that owe oh. their, their success to the uh, fact that we were able to structure something for them right at the outset. Mm. The, 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 the other thing that happened, James, is, is that uh, soon after your struggle to uh, uh, start an MBZ, uh, we had other black banks coming in in quick succession, and there was quite a number of them. Uh, that uh, came in and were creative, innovative, uh, and played the kind of role that uh, you guys played, which is essentially providing access to finance to young black people who would not ordinarily have had uh, that opportunity because of uh, the old uh, white network uh, within the, the banking sector. But something else then happened. Um, and we'll get back to that. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted just to get into your listing of uh, NMBZ uh, in Zimbabwe in the first instance, and then uh, on the, the dual uh, uh, listing in London uh, and uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe. Talk to me about that experience and the thinking behind it. Okay, well, we got to the stage where as... Um... And as a national merchant bank, we were not particularly competitive because of where we were able to um, access capital. And so our thinking was that, well, if we change our license to a retail bank, we can then access retail deposits mm. to be able to do more business. And so we applied for and were uh, given a commercial banking license. At that time, we'd also travel internationally looking for lines of credit. And when we got to some of these uh, financial institutions outside the country, they'd say, well, who are you guys? We were just a local outfit. And so we said at the time, well, let's list, and at the same time, let's list in London. The reason being that Getting a listing on the main board of the London Stock Exchange, you have to jump quite th through quite a few hoops. And somebody who is able to do this and achieve that listing, that speaks volumes for you. It shows that you've got an organization in place that is properly structured, that has the right corporate governance. And so that is one of the reasons why we thought, let's list this because of the, uh, the rigor that we have to put out ourselves through and the organization, the corporate governance structures, so people know that they're actually dealing with a serious outfit here, people who know what they're doing, and people who can actually be looked at uh, 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 on the LSE. And so we did a dual listing on the main board, well, on, on, on the ZSE, and then on the main board 
of the LSC at the same time. We raised 30 million pounds. We were four and a half times, nearly five times oversubscribed. And from there, when we now go to the uh, European capitals and, and, and the, the banks there, and they'd say, well, who are you? We'd say, well, we are NMB. We have listed on the London Stock Exchange. And then a conversation could then start mm -hmm. as to, well, how did you guys achieve that? Mm -hmm. You must be pretty well organized, et cetera. And so it became easier for us to actually raise lines of credit. And from that, we were able to do more and more business. Mm -hmm. To the extent, uh, James, that uh, um, in 2001, I think it's uh, Euro Money, uh, you know, named you as uh, one of the best banks in uh, Zimbabwe. That's correct. Talk to me about um, that uh, achievement and what it meant. You know, at the time, it, 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 for us, it was just doing, continue doing what we were doing, mm. um, striving for excellence, making sure that our customers got a good experience and they wanted to come back and they'd refer other people to us. Mm. So, um, you know, with the, 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 the team that we had, the training that we had, um, this thing was, well, yet another, I suppose, feather in our cap that we were doing the right thing. Mm. Mm. And then we, like I said, we have um, uh, the, the, the market, we have this season where we have more black banks being licensed. In your view, was it the environment that was right or the regulatory environment had been relaxed? Why suddenly did we, were we not experiencing, people were not experiencing the kind of hurdle that you had in starting a bank and we had more players com coming in? What, 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 what explains that in your view? I think I'd like, I'd like to think that um, the authorities could see what a benefit having uh, black run institutions was to the economy. I'd like to think that that was the reasoning. And so it really became a question of, here are the rules, here are the regulations. If you can tick all those boxes, you can be considered for a license. Mm -hmm. And so a number of people were able to come up and tick those boxes and not have people obstructing them. Mm -hmm. you know, with us, it was actually deliberate obstruction where people would, didn't want us to get a license. Uh, we'd be asked, well, who's your godfather? Your political godfather. So we don't have one. Well, in that case, why should we give you a license? <laughs> that was the attitude. And uh, so as, as time went on, and I think when people saw that actually this is a good thing um, in terms of funding uh, a, a black business in the economy, I think it became easier for people to actually get licenses if they were able to show that they had the money and they could uh, uh, actually tick all the boxes. I mean, where I'm going right now, it could be, it could be a whole book, um, James. Um, and I really want us just to touch briefly uh, as, as, as much as, as brief as we can. I mean, we, we then had a tsunami uh, that does exactly the opposite. Yes. Uh, goes after black mm -hmm. banks. Uh, and the allegation being that uh, there's mischief within uh, the black owned banks. Uh, and here we are as Zimbabweans saying, uh, look at any African country and, and, and give us uh, an example of an African country that has got black owned banks that are run properly. But we have this tsunami that comes mm -hmm. in. Well, how do you explain this, James? What happened? Did the banks misbehave? Uh, did the regulators uh, uh, wake up one morning with their minds changed? What exactly took place? Trevor, when, when uh, Leonard Tsumba uh, left the position of central bank governor, the inflation rate in Zimbabwe was 259%. When um, his successor took over, that inflation rate started to run. He started printing money. And when you print a soft currency, it is going to continue to depreciate. And this is what was happening. Now, the way banks are structured, they have to keep a certain liquidity ratio, uh, being that um, they must be able to meet 
customer demands for their money. Customer walks in and says, I want my money, you must be able to give it to them. That liquidity ratio at that time, I think, was 30%. So you had to have liquid or near-liquid funds to be able to meet customer deposits, uh, uh, customer uh, requests for their, for their money. Now, given as a bank that you, so most of your assets are in, in money, you, and you have a depreciating currency, you are losing money by the second. And so a number of the banks then became illiquid by trying to get into something that was going to store value. The only thing that's going to store value in hyperinflation is hard currency or property. Right. That's what's going to... So a number of... Because of our laws here, a number of institutions then couldn't go and buy a whole heap of US dollars. And so they bought property. They bought assets. And they thought, well, okay, this is going to maintain value. And as a result of that, they became quite illiquid. They couldn't meet the liquidity ratios. We were fortunate as NMB. We weren't one of those institutions. Um, but we were a black bank. And uh, I think the authorities at that time, uh, they had this scare, the, 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 the government had the scare of, of MDC suddenly rising. And the allegation was that black banks were funding MDC. Mm. And so the authorities at that stage were given carte blanche to come after us. There were allegations of externalization. And I can be quite specific regarding NMB. Mm. Mm. Because at that time, what the central bank then did is that they, they then engaged firms of auditors to go to the different banks and see what their currency dealings were. And we were called, or we, we got a letter from the central bank saying, right, here are all your currency dealings. Can you account for the money? Mm. And so one of my colleagues who was in charge of banking called the central bank and said, we've got this list uh, from, the, from you guys, which contains a list of all the transactions that we did in currency for the last, so last year or so. And you, we've been asked for explanations as to what happened, where's the money, and why we're doing this, because we're allegedly breaking the law. And on this list are transactions that you yourself, Central Bank, asked us to do for you. Mm. We were buying money for the GMB, for Noxum, for Air Zimbabwe. You asked us to do these transactions, and now you want us to, you're now saying that we were breaking the law when you instructed us to do them. How do you want us to answer these questions? Mm. And the response was, no, don't answer those ones. Answer all the other ones where you're dealing with third parties. And we thought, mm. this is absolutely ridiculous. So we responded. We said, right, this transaction, we bought currency from company A, an exporter, and we sold it to company B, this importer. And here are the acquittal forms, CD1 forms. So we could account for every single penny in terms of those transactions, every penny. But when the central bank got this, because they had a particular agenda, they only looked at the buy side. They only looked at the side where we're buying currency from exporters. Mm -hmm. They did not look at the side, deliberately so, where we were then selling that same currency and accounting for it to the penny, to importers. Mm -hmm. They then allege that we were externalizing money. This is what they came after us for. Mm. And when we saw what was going on, we said, well, we can't reason with these guys. And we left the country. Yours is dramatic. You've shared with uh, me the way you, you, you left. I mean, uh, what a horror. Are you able to share some of those details in terms of how you left and, and, and that haters of, uh, of, of your life as a result of uh, these allegations? Yeah, I don't mind sharing it. Um, I was um, on Lake Kariba. In fact, just before that, a friend of mine, Trevor, said to me, James, with what is going on around us, um, do me a favor and carry your passport around with you. So I went to my office safe, I pulled out my passport, and then there was a credit card, and I put it in my jacket, and I was carrying my passport around with me. On January the 31st of 
2004. It was, uh, I think it was a Friday. There was a banker's dinner. And at that dinner, uh, the guest of honor was Gideon Gorno, the central bank governor, who then started haranguing us for CD1 forms that had not been acquitted. And we were all very shocked that this is what a guest speaker would speak about at a, at a, at a back dinner. And so I think he saw my bemused look and he pointed his finger at me and he said, and you too, Mr. President of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. At that time, I was president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe. So I was a bit taken aback by this. And I thought, my God, things have certainly changed at the central bank. The following morning, I got a call from um, our head of security at NMB, who said to me, the offices have been burgled and there are things that are missing. And I drove to the office and my office and Julius McCorney's office had been broken into. Um, his hard drive was missing from his computer. Wow. Um, he's also used to collect uh, Patek Philippe watches. <laughs> he was an avid collector. Wow. And foolishly, he kept them in his drawer, in his office drawer, uh, instead of in his office safe. And these were missing, sadly. They then broken through the partition between my office and his to get to my office. There was candle wax on the desk. So I thought this is pretty low tech operation if they're using candles to light their way. <laughs> and um, my computer had been taken apart. The hard drive was there, but the CPU was missing. So I thought, well, obviously these guys didn't really know what they were doing. Um, I had a, some money, some US dollars, uh, um, rentals from my ex-wife's property uh, in my drawer, which was missing. And um, candle wax in my secretary's office as well, on her desk. She had some money missing as well. And I called. Uh, at that time, the police were there, and I, I saw them like wandering around. And, and I said, well, aren't you going to take fingerprints? And so, oh, okay. I said, well, aren't you going to take ours as well so you can actually eliminate us from the investigation? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I said to myself, this is an inside job. This is, this is the, this, the state is involved in this, is what I said to myself. And I asked around from a couple of people that I knew, and uh, this was confirmed. So that was the week where a friend of mine said, humor me and carry your passport around. And then a few days later, there was a meeting at the central bank. Central bank governor asked me to stay behind. And he whispered to me uh, when I was left behind, he says, um, trust bank, out. I'm announcing it at 4.30 this afternoon. So I said to myself, why the hell is he telling me this? Why, why keep me behind to tell me this? Anyway, I just thought, well, things are different now at the central bank. And I went back to my office and sure enough at 4.30, this announcement was made. Bank directors being fired by the central bank governor, absolutely unheard of. This had happened. Mm. A few days later, we, uh, we had had a boat on Lake Caribe and uh, our manager had uh, uh, resigned to go off to Zambia. And so I went down there to um, interview a replacement. And whilst I was on the lake, uh, I got a call from um, my um, wife at the time saying, last night at midnight, eight um, carloads of policemen came to arrest you. Mm. And I said, what? Yes. And I said, so what did you do then? Well, I didn't open the gate because I had a pack of dogs that, that, that used to be my guard dogs. And... Um, so the wife did not open the gate because I didn't want the police to damage the dogs. Because this is what they would have done, I suppose. To. I told them that you weren't there and uh, told them to come back in the morning. So I called my sister, who was uh, a lawyer, an advocate, and I said, what should I do? And she said, well, you want to come back and find out what you want, what they want. So I went back to our hospital to pack up and... When I was there, I got another call from my sister saying, no, I've been talking to my colleagues 
uh, Advocate Chris Anderson was one of the mm. colleagues at the time who said, no, no, they just want to humiliate and tell them to leave the country. And that's what I, exactly what I did that night, Trevor. I mm. left the country, a pair of shorts, a T-shirt, a pair of flip-flops, a knapsack, an orange, a screwdriver from the boat, because I didn't know if I might encounter fence on the Zambian side. And I went over to Lake Kariba, uh, to the Zambian side, waded in water, uh, up to my neck because the boat couldn't get to the shore because it was a bit too many rocks. And so between me and the crocodile was a pair of pliers. Fortunately, fortunately I didn't meet up with any crocodiles and I was able to get onto shore. And Trevor, we're going to be here all day if I tell you exactly what happened. I know, what I know. Um, but it, had you eventually, Trevor, we got, yeah, got to London. Been, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, from uh, Siavonga, the, the Zambian side of Kurida, I was able to get to Lusaka, get onto an aeroplane to Johannesburg and then fly mm -hmm. to London mm -hmm. and arrived in February in London when it's bitterly cold in a pair of flip-flops, a t-shirt and a pair of shorts, mm -hmm. wondering so, what the mm -hmm. devil is going on. So there was a lot of you that were then accused of uh, externalizing and you're supposed to be on the run. Were you charged? And if you were charged, how come you then were able to come back into the country later on? What happened, Trev, is that um, the bank was charged with these um, allegations. And um, the bank was... Um, I'm not sure what actually happened. I think it might have been uh, uh, found guilty of externalization, uh, which in essence, as I explained, was we were buying currency from exporters and selling it to importers. So we weren't keeping any money for ourselves, aside from the profits that we might have been made on the, on the uh, exchange difference between what we bought the currency for and what we sold it for. So there was absolutely no money that was externalized by us. Uh, and so it came to 2007, and I said to my partners, I said, listen, we've been here for now three years. And at that time when I left, I thought I'd be away for a fortnight before the authorities realized what a big mistake they'd made. And yeah, three years later, we're still there. And I said to my colleagues, listen, one of us has to go back. One of our parents is going to die, and we're not going to be able to go back and bury them. We need to sort this thing out with the authorities. So we had a lot of discussions. And um, I agreed to then come back. I came back in, I think it was in September 2007, um, got to the airport, um, nothing happened. Went about my business, uh, spoke to my lawyers at the time, who spoke to the Attorney General's office, who said that there's, he wasn't looking for me. And then went back to London a fortnight later to settle my daughter into university. Um, then came back here. And when I came back, when I was at the baggage carousel, I had a tap on the shoulder saying, oh, you must have sure from NMB. And I said, yes, I'm going to come with me, sir, they said. So I went off to this uh, office, which was the uh, airport police, I think CID people. And they said, right, we have orders to detain you. So I sat around for a good three quarters of an hour waiting for the next thing to happen. Nothing happened. I said, listen, I've got people waiting for me. Here's the address of where I'm going to be. Uh, if you want me, come and get me from there. And I left. Went to my parents' house, where is the address that I'd given the police. And whilst we're sitting having brunch, uh, two cars of policemen came to the house. And I said, right, we've come to take him away. And they took me, uh, and they took me to CID fraud in Robson Manica Avenue. And that was on a Wednesday. And they were clearly taking instructions from the central bank because they'd come along and they said, quote, incorrect chapters of the Exchange Control Act. And I said, well, that one actually talks about such and such a thing. What is it that you want to charge me with? And for three days, they couldn't, actually find what they wanted to charge me with. And then they decided that they're uh, going to lock me up at Roseville Police Station. 
Um, after I'd been locked up for more than 48 hours, my lawyers sought a habeas corpus and I was released. And um, then on the, that was on the Saturday. On the Monday, my lawyer called me saying, um, I have policemen in my office who want to arrest me unless you go back to the magistrate's court. And I said, well, I've been released by the high court. Why would I want to go to the magistrate's court? It's a lower court. And I said, listen, they're going to, they're going to arrest me unless you come back. So I went to the magistrate's court and there was my lawyers and they said to me, what, James, what, what have you been involved in? I said, why? And they said, well, I can count at least like a dozen security people here who are here with malice of forethought for you. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know what was going on. So we went to the magistrate's court. The prosecutor started pleading as to why I ought to not be given bail. And my lawyer said, they said, well, he was given by bail by the high court. And the magistrate said, well, are you going to plead for your client or not? And my lawyer was flummoxed. And then the magistrate then, um, he, my lawyer then started pleading. And the magistrate then said, right, I'll give you a decision tomorrow. She banged the gavel and off she walked. The next day, the magistrate went on strike. <laughs> and I was locked up at remand. And it took another, I think I was there for 17 days, Trevor. And uh, I was granted bail. The chief magistrate then came along when everybody was on strike, granted bail. But because there was no transport to take me to the uh, 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 magistrate's court, um, I was there in, in remand for, for I think, 17 days. nights. 17 nights, I think I was there for. Mm. And eventually I was picked up. And the strange thing, Trevor, when I was picked up, my uncle picked me up. And as I was walking towards the car, he said, hurry, hurry, hurry. And I hurried, and I said, well, what is the problem? He says, we've got to get away from here. And what had happened, Trevor, is that the prisons commissioner had been told that no matter what comes along, for my release, I must not be released. Hmm. And the prisons commissioner, God bless his soul, contacted my uncle and said, go and pick up your nephew right away before yeah. I can release this letter. And that's what happened. Wow. So when I left, I then made sure I didn't go back to my parents' house where these guys might come and pick me up again. I went and I stayed somewhere else hmm. until... Um, eventually, I think the, the heat died down. Um, I was then, my passport had been taken, uh, so I was stuck in Zimbabwe for, uh, that was now uh, October 2007. I was then stuck there until August the following year. Uh, the trial, quote unquote, started in April. After several witnesses, my lawyer stood up and said to the magistrate, the state has done nothing to advance its case. Please acquit my client. The magistrate who um, I subsequently found out was wondering why on earth is this man on trial, put me on my defense to make sure that there could be no further, no appeals ever. I was put on my defense and I was acquitted of all these charges. And I was found guilty of leaving the country without having my passport stamped. <laughs> and that attracted a fine in the princely amount of the equivalent of that time of about 10 US cents. After all that trouble. Yeah. A good 10 months, Trevor, mm. of my time being wasted so they could find me 10 cents. Mm. What, what Putting me in remand prison for nearly mm. three weeks as, and, and this is what we see happening a lot of Trevor, where people are arrested on spurious charges and they're locked up in remand prison. And then when they're released, nothing happens. As a, and this is what happened to me when I was released from remand. People commenting, particularly uh, the, the, the people connected politically, were saying to me, Nyaya Pera. You should be okay no, with that. There's still a case to okay come. And I said, well, there's. Mm -hmm. There's no case. And you see this happening. Look at the number of 
Hukol Chnona is a case in point. Um, people being yeah. arrested, being punished mm. before there's any trial. Mm. Talk to me now, uh, James, before we, we leave this subject. When you reflect at what happened to you and what happened to other colleagues, in your conscience, was there a responsibility on the part of the bankers? Um, was, this, was any of this in any way justified? Or you think there were shenanigans um, behind the scenes? You know, Jeff, I think it's a mixture of things. There were, sadly, some of the fellow bankers who had dipped into the coffers of the bank uh, and had huge loans, which they could not pay back. Um, and then some of them were purely caught in the liquidity crisis where they had calls where there'd be a run on the bank and the bank wouldn't be able to meet the commitments. Mm. And this is always problematic because you could have a situation where this happens bank after bank after bank. So uh, it was a mixture of um, political gamesmanship, as it were, and uh, also people taking, those politicians taking advantage of the um, crisis that some banks had in terms of liquidity to then also go after them personally. Mm. So it was a mixture of things. Mm. Wow. You, 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 you raise each issue of, um, you know, Hopewell Chinono, who's been arrested a number of times, which take, takes us, um, uh, James, as far as I'm concerned, to your appointment in April 2016 as uh, the town clerk or chief executive of uh, the city of Harare, the capital city. But you've never been able to take, to take on that position. What's happening, James? You change your mind. What happened, Trevor, is that when I was still at um, NMB, when I was still running NMB Bank, um, Much Masunda, a very good uh, Mukoma of mine, um, would speak to me often and say, you guys need to put something back. He'd make the point to me that, you know, my fellow councillors, the bulk of them, this is their only source of income. And their only qualification that they have is the fact that they were brave enough to stand up to ZANU-PF and won a council election. And so it's very easy to... Um, corrupt them because this is all they have. This is the main source of living. So if a council official comes along to them and says, right, here's $500 sign here for this contract, they'll sign it. I need guys like you, which would say, to be involved in the audit committee and trying to assist in running the city. And I said too much, which right now I've got too much on my plate. But when I finish with NMB, I'd be happy to get involved. So when I finished NMB, uh, when I retired from there, I then got um, this vacancy then came up and I threw my name into the hat, vacancy for Town Cloud. Um, I was shortlisted. I was interviewed, I think a panel of some 20 interviewers, which were like, largely counselors and there's some also some HR people. And then I was offered the position. Uh, Bernard Manyeni was the mayor at the time. And um, he called me and said to me, James, um, you have the position, but I need you to sign this contract right away because the politicians don't want it to happen. Because there's something in the Urban Councils Act, Trevor, which suggests that the appointment of town clerk needs to be approved by the local government board which is uh, people in, from the Ministry of uh, Local Government. However, the new constitution talks about devolution, where um, you know, councils, et cetera, are supposed to run their own affairs. And so we had the situation where the mayor, quite rightly so, was going by the new constitution. Um, but the ministry, which was run by Sebe Casquera at the time, was pulling back. So I signed this contract. Then I also called Savior. I knew him. And I said, what's going on? 
And he says, well, you should have told me that you wanted this job. I said, in my book, Sadie, that's called canvassing. That's against the law. And he says, no, no, no. This is the second biggest job in the country. We want to make sure that whoever's running it is one of us. So I said, what do you mean, one of you? This is about women like me. What do you mean, one of you? <laughs> and he says, no, 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 my brother, you should have told me, you're going to do this job over my dead body. Wow. And I said, really, Trev? Really, Savior? And he says, yes. So I said, you know I'm going to fight you, don't you? And he says, Hyundai Torn, and he put the phone Wow. Down. So I then reported to the office beginning of April, as my contract said. And the only person who cooperated with me was the mayor. No one else wanted to be there. Mm. I think they also knew that I was going to be, I was going to try and fix things. Mm. Trevor, within the the first week of getting there, unsolicited, I had telephone calls from European financial institutions offering me money to rehabilitate the city's water, the city's health system, on very extended terms. And the comment was, James, now that you're there, we want to do business. We want to fix Harada. I had European ambassadors coming to see me with executives of Viola Water Company in tow, saying, here's what we want to do. And at that time, there was a tender to rehabilitate Morton Jeffrey Waterworks. The French were offering to do this rehabilitation for, I think it was some $60 million or thereabouts. But we went with the Chinese for $110 million. Nearly double the price wow. for the same work. It didn't make any sense. Mm. And of course, in this process, you then discover that there's you know, money going here, there, and everywhere. I started getting reports from internal audit um, about things that have been going on there. And this got to the attention of people who didn't want me looking into these things. And as a result, there was this concerted effort to make sure that I got out of there. The mayor, as you know, was arrested and detained on instructions of mm-hmm. the local government minister, Xavier Casquera. Uh, but he was resolute. The only person that I could put my hand on my heart and say was straight there was Bernard Mangé. Mm. The others I don't know, mm. but I suspect that many of the uh, uh, executives and the councillors there were taking advantage of the situation and making money. As we see now, we read about the allocations of land and the, the land barons and how contracts get awarded and the water chemicals contract is very fraught. So there was a lot of cleaning up to do and people didn't want me to do it. So I was suspended um, when um, when the Mayini was uh, arrested and detained. The deputy mayor then wrote a letter suspending me, which I ignored. I carried on going to the office. And then one day I went to the office. So I was there for about three or four weeks, Trevor. Um, but not being able to achieve very much because no one would cooperate with me. One day I went to the office uh, after lunch and there were lock blocks in my office, on on my office doors. My first inclination was to call a locksmith to come and break it. And when I tried to do that, the mayor's um, driver saw me and said, please don't do that. You see those men over there? They're plainclothes policemen waiting to arrest you for vandalism. Mm. Please don't, don't break open those locks. Wow. So from there, I went to my lawyers and then um, had the, my lawyers try to get me back into the office. And sadly, the matter was not deemed urgent and it never went anywhere. Mm. And that's how I was gotten rid of at the council. So your f- our good friend, 
much more soon to say is people like you ought to come in and help out. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sevia Kasukure says, no, you're not one of us. You shouldn't come in Correct. here. Speak mm-hmm. to me, James, about what this particular incident says to you about where we are as a nation. You know, the sad thing, Trevor, is that we have a kleptocracy running the country. That's a sad thing. Mm-hmm. That's a long and the short of it. We are... We, broken a lot of the institutions that should be assisting in fixing this. And we have a situation where if you're connected politically, mm. you can do as you please. Mm. It's free for all. Mm. And it doesn't appear to be any will to actually fix this. We set up this anti-corruption commission and people are getting, as people say, this catch and release. A couple of very high-profile people arrested where there's clearly cases to answer and nothing's happened to them. Mm. Mm. And it's going on every day. We, I mean, you read about it every day. People mm. from all walks of life being picked up for these crimes. And so corruption, sadly, is what is destroying the very fabric of society. Mm. And there doesn't seem to be the, 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 the will to actually do something substantive about it. There's a lot of talk, but no one walks the talk. Mm. Are you hopeful about our nation, uh, James, from where you sit? You no, know, Trev, um, I don't think I'm going to see the change in my lifetime, mm. sadly. Um, I don't see a situation where we are going to follow our constitution such that we can have a free and fair election. Mm. And if we had the will to do that, we would just follow our own institution. We could fix this country in a very short space of time. Mm. But we need to follow our own constitution and have people at the top there who are going to make sure that we follow our constitution. And from there, good things will come. Mm. But not right now. The rule of law. Not right now. It's, it's, It's... we don't seem to have the, the will to actually do it. We talk about it, but, you know, eight years after the Constitution was implemented, we still have laws that offend the Constitution. Mm. I mean, it's, aligning the laws should be something that could have been done in a matter of weeks, Mm. not eight years. Mm. And that shows that the will isn't there. Mm. Well, I think on that uh, note, James, that's where I think I ought to, we we got to lighten things up a little bit. Let me ask you and say, James, uh, you know, what books are you reading? Um, the people that show, follow this show uh, from Zimbabwe uh, across the continent and in the, the diaspora love reading books. Are there books that you've read, James, that have left an indelible mark on you and would want to, to recommend them to our viewers? Um, I love William Shakespeare. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, Richard the Second, Richard the Third, those plays in particular. And then there's a book that I'm reading, Trevor. I've got it here because I knew you'd ask me such a question. Yeah. <laughs> is, um, can you see that? Yeah. Wow. Tyrant. Stephen, yeah. Stephen yeah. Greenblatt. Oh. Mm. And I'll read you just a little bit here. It, um, in Tyrant, Stephen Greenblatt examines the themes of power and tyranny in some of Shakespeare's most famous plays. So it's, um, he asks the question, how does a truly disastrous leader, a sociopath, a demagogue, a tyrant come to power? Mm. How and why does a tyrant hold on to power? And what goes on in the hidden recesses of the tyrant's soul? Mm. Wow. For help in understanding our most urgent contemporary dilemmas, William Shakespeare has no peer. 
<laughs> so Greenback then writes about power in Shakespeare. And it's amazing the number of parallels one can then draw to tyrants the world over, mm. even in our part of the world. Mm. So that's a particularly um, interesting book that I am reading. Mm. And then there's some others which uh, I've read. I don't know whether Lee Kuan Yew's book from oh. Third World to First mm. has been recommended here, but that's... No, it hasn't. Worth it hasn't. Reading. It's a beautiful book, yeah. Something we could do in Zimbabwe. Mm. Yes, there's questions regarding this um, overhandedness, etc. But we 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 do need to fix our country for, if not for our sake, for our children's sake. Mm. So, so James, you, you you say two things there, which I want to just to push now. Um, you you're not hopeful that you will see the change that you'd want to see in your time, but you talk, you raise the issue about our children. Uh, mm -hmm. What message do you have? Because you and I are going to be checking out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people that have the biggest interest, the biggest stakeholders uh, in this nation right now are your kids and my kids and mm -hmm. their generation. And they're going to be here longer than us. What message do you have for them regarding the burden that awaits them if they have to change this country? This country belongs to them. They are as Zimbabwean as anybody in the hierarchy. And they must understand the fact that there's strength in numbers. If they all refuse to be used and they all stand up for what is right, people will listen and change will come. Mm. It might not be through the ballot box in the next election, but if they're resolute and they come out and they stand for what is right, as has happened in many other countries, look at what happened in Malawi recently. Mm. Who would have thought that was going to happen there? Mm. It's happened in some uh, other countries around the world where people have said, no, let's do things properly. Let's mm. do things correctly. It's our future. This is our country. Then we can stop a situation where just a handful of Zimbabweans benefit from all the wealth of this country. It should be for everyone. Mm. Wow. That's a powerful message right there, uh, James. Uh, thank you so much for creating the time to join me on, uh, in conversation with Trevor. Um, remain there, James, and allow me to focus on our viewers uh, on, in Zimbabwe in the first instance on the continent and then in the diaspora. So thank you for following in conversation with Trevor, which is a weekly show. We are out every Monday at uh, 7 a.m. for quality conversations. To ensure that you don't miss out on any of these conversations, I invite you to click on this red button and subscribe, and you get a notification every time we have uh, a quality conversation such as the one that we've had. We've also gone a step further and created podcasts for those who want to listen uh, and not to watch. And if you scroll under this conversation, you'll find the link uh, to the podcast. So thank you so much for watching. Until next time, cheers to you all.